Well, I can keep an eye out for people coming in after we start, but uh, if you're okay to go, Dr. Comp, we can get going. All right. So uh, just to introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Comp really quick. So he is a APD at the Creighton School of Medicine, Emergency Medicine Residency, uh, and an associate professor at the U of A College of Medicine, Phoenix. And he's interested in EM, obviously, and wilderness medicine, especially. So he's here to talk today about uh, some submission, uh, submersion and drowning injuries. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, uh, first off, this is an incredible group uh, of really highly uh, motivated people. And I love that you're doing this. Um, I'm going to put my uh, my contact information at the end of, of this uh, PowerPoint, but um, uh, it's awesome you guys are starting to get involved so early on, and I'd love to help, so let me know what I can do um, to, to kind of give you guys a hand through this. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right. Is that up for you guys? Perfect. Okay. All right. And then... Um, uh, Luke, can you do me a favor? So while I'm doing this, I turned off all sort of the, uh, the, the chat stuff. So if anyone has any questions or anything, can you just interrupt me and, and let me know if we need to have a clarification or something? Absolutely. And it's definitely a small enough group to where if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and pipe up. Oh yeah, please do. This is very much a, uh, um, uh, a discussion, uh, along with the lecture too. So, um, so drowning, right? I mean, we're, we're all in Arizona and it is uh, almost September, but, um, but August, and it's a, it's a really concerning time. Um, we see a lot of this in the ER. Um, I, we see it nationally, but especially here in the Southwest when this is one of really the only things that we can do to cool off every once in a while, right? Um, so I'm going to do a little, bit of a, a little bit of a mix. We're going to start off with um, what are the things that we're concerned about when it comes to drowning, and then we're also going to focus on how we uh, do some of the backcountry rescue, but also how we incorporate that into the uh, into the emergency department. But one of my big things is recognizing that uh, wilderness, wilderness medicine is everywhere, um, from you know downtown New York, New York, where you can have uh, hyperthermia or hypothermia and uh, and frostbite, all the way to down here where we have all of our snakes, scorpions, um, heat stroke, all that kind of stuff. So finding uh, that link between wilderness and um, and emergency medicine is one of my big uh, my big interests, and I'd love to chat with anyone else about about this as if you have any other interest too. So start off with um, I want you guys to sort of uh, think of this as as you. So you are standing on a rock and you see this happening. Uh, so you got this guy that's doing a little bit of rafting. Uh, maybe getting a little bit in over his head, um, and he just gets tossed. So as you uh, as you can see in this video, um, there's the guy that pops out, but his raft just continues to get thrown. Uh, so he was he was very lucky that he was able to uh, to get thrown rather than getting stuck here with this sort of like continuous tumbling. So that's our stage. That's what's going on. So what do we do from here? Um, we're going to talk about a couple different things. We're gonna go through a little bit of epi because we just kind of need to with any kind of lecture, right? We're gonna talk about some definitions, some pathophys, um, some of our pre-hospital and some of our hospital care as well as uh, our wilderness concerns and some of the things that we need to be doing to make sure that we're taking the best care of our patients. Um, so drowning is the third leading cause of unintentional injury death worldwide. Uh, worldwide, right? That's incredible. Uh, between 1999 and 2010, there were 46,000 deaths in the U.S. So that's about 10 deaths per day uh, due to drowning and submersion issues. Um, so it is a uh, it's a it's a for realsiest thing we need to be keeping an eye out for. Um, I'm going to harp a little bit on definitions. Um, drowning is the primary respiratory impairment that um, that happens from a submersion or immersion in a liquid medium. So it is not a definition on morbidity, no, or mortality, or, or any kind of other definition, right? So there's no such thing as a near drowning, a wet drowning, a dry, active, passive, secondary. It is not a thing. So drowning has to do with the actual oxygenation and how water liquid uh, interacts in that, side, in that kind of a capacity. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about this. This is a really horrific case. Um, a four-year-old uh, was knocked over by a boat wake um, in Texas. Uh, and it was initially thought, and it was kind of propagated by the media, that he had this dry drowning, right? So there was a thought that maybe he aspirated a little bit of water, and then a long time afterwards, that's when the actual drowning occurred. Again, going back to our definitions, this is not a thing. 
Um, unfortunately, what, what happened with this whole, whole horrible case, this little boy got a, uh, this initial uh, inhalation injury, was discharged, and then came back very, very sick. When you actually look at the, uh, the autopsy report and the cause of death, um, it was a delayed uh, cardiomyopathy, and he had a viral myocarditis, which causes death. So this was not anything, frankly, related to, uh, to the drowning process or any kind of aspiration that he had. But these, you hear these things, and almost every year we kind of have the same kind of, all right, we got to go back to the drawing board with the media and with the general public of, no, this is, there's no such thing as, as these delayed and dry and all these alternative definitions of drowning. So um, drowning does not equal an outcome, right? So drowning does not discuss how, how someone ultimately, ultimately clinically does. Um, drowning equals a process. So this is how... Uh, and the body is, or pardon me, the process is how your body interacts and, and um, reacts to any kind of submersion injury. So what actually happens? Um, initially, in a submersion type injury or, or uh, forced submersion uh, exposure, you have voluntary, pre voluntary breath holding, hypoxia with uh, altered loss of, or with loss of consciousness or altered level of consciousness, maybe some water, water aspiration, maybe some involuntary learning spasm and reflexive water swallowing. There's actually a minimal amount of water that's aspirated into the lungs. Um, in in uh, cadaveric studies, it's less than 30 mils. So you're really not filling up the bronchopulmonary tree and it's not a full, um, uh, it's not a full sort of washout of everything. Um, the issue isn't with the lungs filling with water. The issue is the brain. So drowning is a, is a brain problem with lung issues. Hypoxia is the key here. So it is your brain not getting enough oxygen, which causes you to have the syncopal, not syncopal event, excuse me, to have the loss of consciousness and then possibly some of these other sequelae that we're gonna talk about. But the, primarily ca the primary cause of death in drowning is hypoxia. And I wanna make sure that we continue to sort of harp on that throughout this whole discussion. Um, you can have some direct lung injury, right? You can have some alveolar, alveolar collapse, sorry, I guess. Um, you can have, uh, again, some atelectasis, some intrapulmonary shunting and some washout of the surfactant um, with some edema and inflammation. But again, that occurs after the initial hypoxic failure. Um, we sometimes see some arrhythmias, um, but frankly, it's usually a sinus tack or bradycardia um, or PEA or even in asystole. You really only have V-fib or some sort of shockable rhythm in about 10% of your cases. Um, and usually those patients are the ones that have uh, predisposing um, coronary artery disease or any kind of like severe hypothermia or something else that's concomitant to the drowning event. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, so we talk about, hey, if you drown in salt water versus if you drown in fresh water, um, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of electrolyte changes and stuff. And we really used to, to harp on this up into, an, up and into like the, the middle 90s. But really, um, this all came from a series of studies that was done in the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, a bunch of really hypertonic, uh, uh, hypertonic fluids were instilled into tracheas of anesthetized dogs. Um, and they were giving, um, they were trying to essentially see if you had any changes, but they were giving up to 11 mils per kilo, per kilo of this hypertonic fluids and up to 44 mils per kilo uh, to have and see some of these electrolyte changes. And what, what we just talked about, so there's about one to three mils in an actual human when you have uh, of true aspiration and drowning. So there really isn't enough of a volume to have any kind of significant electrolyte shift except for one place in the world, and that's the Dead Sea. Um, you have um, chloride, magnesium, and uh, I think calcium changes uh, because it is so hypertonic in comparison to the rest of the world. It's the only place that you may see some electrolyte, uh, some electrolyte changes, but for most patients that you're gonna see, it's, it's just not clinically significant, uh, and it wouldn't really change that much on, on your labs. Um, we're going to change gears a little bit. Uh, we talked about some of the pathophys and some of the epidemiology behind drowning. And I want to talk a little bit about um, what we do when we first start seeing these patients. So let's go back to our case, right? So you saw the, you saw the person get tossed in his raft, um, and you're now working on how, what do I do with this patient that uh, is now, or 
victim that is now in the water kind of flailing really without much of a uh, um, uh, much of any kind of, uh, of a rescue going on. So the first portion is identifying your team capability. So what kind of rescue uh, personnel do you have right now? Um, understanding, recognizing your scene safety. Um, patient is usually, the patient is usually around the third or fourth priority um, when it comes to any kind of rescue. Your own safety is first priority, your team safety is second priority, and then you finally get to the patient. Because you're not doing anyone good if you or any of your rescue members are, uh, are now becoming patients or victims in the, in the entire situation. Um, and then actually performing the rescue. So we're gonna break these down in, into a little bit more. And we talk about uh, the identification of your team. Right, so is this the group that you're going out with, right? Are you performing a rescue when you have this kind of a group or is this the kind of a group that you're going out with when you're performing any kind of rescue, right? So knowing the limitations and knowing who you're with is really, really incredible. And that goes from the rescue capabilities to the medical support um, and your transporting facilities as well. Because um, some of the smaller, smaller areas don't really have a big center that can, that can take care of these patients. And then with our rescue, so we talked about how drowning is an oxygen problem, right? Uh, it is a brain problem with lung issues. So we prioritize our airway. We need to interrupt that drowning process, right? So we talked about how drowning is the hypoxic results of some sort of submersion. So you have to stop the drowning process. And usually what we do is rescue breaths, right? So we deliver breaths, um, we assist in ventilation, and that's how we stop that drowning process. Um, I'm not going to really get into it that much, but there's something called in-water resuscitation, um, and it's done, again, if you are at a highly, highly, highly technically trained location, um, if you have a patient that is uh, that has a pulse but is unconscious and is having inadequate or absent respirations, you're essentially giving rescue breaths in the water. Now, um, this, was a, uh, this was done in Brazil. All of our information on this comes from uh, a single study uh, single retrospective study on trained lifeguards uh, with helo backup and mannequins. So they were dropping people in the surf, uh, I guess, further out to ocean than the breaking of the waves. Um, and they were trying to see if they could do this. They had some in, uh, improvement in survival and neurological outcomes um, in person, in the people receiving in water resuscitation, but it increased the rescue time, it increased the number of submersions, and it increased the amount of, of water aspiration. So uh, this is not something that should be, frankly, done, in my opinion, unless you are, uh, you are a highly, highly trained location that drills and practices this and actually makes this part of your, of your rescue algorithm. Um, compression only CPR. So we just talked about how, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're stopping the drowning process. So compression only CPR is excellent for a primary cause, uh, of, with cardiac uh, issues as a primary cause, right? Because of that, we know that pediatrics um, and drowning patients really don't do well with compression only because it's not a heart problem, right? So these patients need to have the rescue breaths. So compression only CPR just won't work for them. What about the Heimlich maneuver, right? So can we try to get some of that water out? Um, will that make any difference? And again, it's really not an issue with the water that's in. It's figuring out how you can increase the ventilation to increase the oxygenation. Um, so we really don't recommend the Heimlich or any of the kind of like knee pumping or anything that they used to do. Um, it also, unfortunately, teaches a different protocol uh, from the regular uh, Heimlich cases, right? So we use the Heimlich for, um, for choking, but it's a little bit more of an extension um, when it starts to happen with drowning. ADs, right? Should we shock them? So we talked earlier about how only 10% of these cardiac arrests are um, are primarily cardiac caused. Now, uh, part of the rescue effort is making sure that you're understanding what caused the drowning, right? Did someone have a big MI which caused them to fall in the water and now we're dealing with two different processes or was it a primary drowning issue? Um, one of my favorite parts about emergency medicine and wilderness medicine is we get to do actually like pretty fun research. Um, so there was a really, really cool study uh, where people essentially put mannequins on someone's chest and then drove around in a little Zodiac boat to see if the bouncing of the boat on the waves and the water could interrupt an AED and make it say a rhythm was shockable when it wasn't. Um, they found no episodes of, a, of an AED incorrectly identifying a shockable rhythm. 
Um, the other really cool thing uh, is wet environments. So we have some animal models that show that as long as the pads are placed firmly on a patient's chest and there's no direct contact with the patient, um, you can use an AED in a wet environment um, without an increased risk from, from normal. So you don't electrify the entire patient if they're still wet. But the issue is you don't really have good contact. So it may not be a, a safety issue. It may be much more of a, um, uh, an efficacy issue if you do need to use an AED on your patients. C-spine. Um, so should all these patients be coming in with C-spine? Um, the all-come incidence of, uh, of C-spine injury in drowning patients is about 0.5 to 5%. Um, uh, 11 of 2,244 submerged victims had C-spine injuries, and all 11 of them uh, had clinical signs of serious injury, had a history of diving, had a motorized vehicle crash, or had a fall from height. So this is where history becomes the biggest, biggest issue. Um, if you don't know what's, happen what, what's happened, yeah, you can do C-spine. But if it was a witnessed event, um, and it doesn't sound like it was a traumatic issue, you really don't need to maintain C-spine precautions because that could absolutely hinder your ability to deliver, to deliver rescue breaths or stop that drowning process with oxygenation. So how do we evacuate, right? Uh, let's say you are a lifeguard or you're up at Bartlett Lake or Pleasant or something around here. Um, someone comes to you and says, oh, I think someone may have drowned. They're okay and they're, they're breathing fine now. What, what, do you, what can you recommend? If there's any evidence of abnormal lung sounds, any uh, any severe cough, frothy sputum, foamy material in the airway, um, hypotension, or, uh, or decreased mental status, obviously, then you're going to send them. Outside of that, you can kind of just let them hang out for a little and, and see what happens. We're going to talk about the ED disposition for some of these patients in a moment as well. So how do we, what do we actually do? Now that we have these patients that are here, um, how do we start? Um, and for all of you that are interested in EMS or know sort of how EMS works, there are some very specific questions that we can ask our pre-hospital friends or our rescuers uh, to give us a lot of information. Uh, and I was trying to think of a couple of the ones that would help me the most. I mean, obviously, description of the scene, the time submerged, the location, potential known contaminants. I mean, was this was this in a lake or did they they drown in I don't know, like a uh, uh, like a waste repository or something? What was the water temperature? Was there any kind of vomiting? What type of rescue was this? A uh, a rescue or mediated uh, uh, retrieval, or did the person help with their own evacuation? And then what were some of the precipitating events that happened that brought this patient here today? Um, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of questions and discussion points with EMS are really, really going to be super important to make sure that you're providing the best care for the patient. And then going back, it's always oxygenation. Um, I have here something called the ARDSNET uh, card. So uh, without getting too into the weeds, um, this uh, this is a group uh, that created the optimal amount of, uh, of PEEP and ventilator settings to allow for the best type of oxygenation. So if you have to intubate a patient, following a regular ARDSNET pathway is always going to be the best. And this is a very, very easy to find chart. Um, and going through how we use it is a little bit out of the scope of this discussion, um, but uh, using a um, a lung protective strategy for your ventilation is going to be the most important thing to do. Um, and imaging, what do we do? So now that we have the patient a little bit more stable, um, what about a chest x-ray? So an initial chest x-ray doesn't really show any, uh, any change, or pardon me, doesn't indicate any possible change with any kind of ABGs, outcomes, or dispositions. You can use it to track your changes, but an initial chest x-ray that looks normal doesn't really tell you that much. Um, an initial chest x-ray that already looks bad gives you a lot of information. Same with a, with a head CT. A normal head CT doesn't give any information. Um, the thing that we start worrying about is uh, like any sort of cerebral edema due to hypoxia. So that's not gonna happen for quite a while. So unless you have concerns for the possibility of concomitant trauma, a, uh, a head CT for all comers with drowning really isn't necessary. If you do get a CT of the chest, this is what you're going to see. So a lot of dependent atelectasis, maybe a little bit of, um, uh, of increased markings in some of the vasculature um, and some of the pulmonary trees, but um, it's mostly just going to show you this diffuse um, sort of increased density 
where we should be having much more uh, full aeration. What kind of lab should we get? Um, maybe you can get a VBG. Uh, maybe you can get an AVG. If you still think that this person is kind of altered and you don't really know what happened, then we have to be going through our altered mental status labs and our altered mental status evaluation, uh, including some other labs, possibly other imaging. But when it comes to the drowning itself and a person that looks otherwise okay, there's not a lot that we're going to get from additional labs. How about antibiotics? Should everyone that comes in with drowning get antibiotics? 12% um, of patients that were rescued from drowning had pneumonia and were, uh, were needed to be treated with an antibiotic agent in, in a single, single center study. It was very small. That doesn't give us a lot of evidence, but it does help us determine and use a shared decision-making model to talk to our patients and say, hey, we're not going to start you on a broad spectrum antibiotic now. If you were feeling worse and you do have some sort of aspiration pneumonia that develops and you're looking otherwise okay, then you just need to come back. If they are inpatient, it should be, uh, it should be guided by sputum, aspirate, and cultures. Um, this is one of my favorite charts. So this comes from the, uh, the Wilderness Medical Society guidelines on, uh, on drowning, and submersion uh, uh, drowning and submersion injuries. Pardon me. Um, this came from a single retrospective study, but they had 42,000 lifeguard rescues. Um, and this serves a lot of our information. This gives us a lot of our information on what we actually do and how we disposition these patients. Um, so I want to highlight a couple different things. If you have a patient that has normal oscillation on breath sounds and no cough, they had a 0% mortality. Even if they had a normal oscillation and they had a cough, they had a 0% mortality. But what's interesting is how much of a jump happens if you have any kind of a challenge finding a radial pulse. Um, and this was, uh, they use radial pulse as their sign of hypotension because this was a, uh, this was a pre-hospital study that was done with lifeguards. So they didn't always have blood pressure management or monitoring. But if you have a patient that comes in with pulmonary edema that's concerning uh, developing pulmonary edema due to your physical exam and auscultation, plus decreased radial pulse or hypotension, your mortality went from 5.2, if you could feel good pulses, to 19% if you had a hard time finding pulses. And then obviously, uh, going through again, your, uh, pardon, let me go back, your respiratory arrest, cardiopulmonary arrest, um, you're having pretty high mortalities from those as well. But I think the most important thing is finding your hypotension and finding your pulse and seeing how, uh, how your patient is, uh, in, how your patient is doing in those two clinical aspects, um, because that really gives us a huge jump in the concerning uh, concern for mortality in these patients. All right. So what do we do? Um, who can we actually send home? Does everyone have to come into the hospital? What's a concerning story? What's a not concerning story? Um, so usually we can send a patient home if we do a four to six hour ED observation. They have normal mental status and they have normal respiratory function. And that kind of recommendation comes from three different studies. Um, they're all really small. Um, 33, 33 patients were all, uh, were all looked at and followed. Uh, within six hours, none of these had any kind of delayed effects. There was a retrospective study of 48 pediatric patients. Um, all, there were only 13 that had significant um, continued hypoxia. And all of those events occurred and were detectable within four hours of them coming to the ED. And finally, um, there's another one that looked at hospitalized patients. Um, there were only, uh, let me actually let me think this one through. So it was for all the patients that were initially asymptomatic uh, that went on to develop symptoms during their stay, they all developed within 4.5 hours. Um, except for the one patient that happened at six. So we have this kind of four to six in our head, but it's frankly pretty crappy evidence. Um, so it's going to be a lot of uh, discussion with your inpatient colleagues, uh, your observation team, and the patient um, to sort of determine the best course of action, especially if you're on the fence um, to on whether or not to discharge or, or to send them, or to, pardon me, to discharge or, or to bring them into the hospital for observation. Um, here would be the things that we're, we're going to be obviously admitting them for right away. Abnormal vital signs, initial radiographic signs, um, and abnormal blood gas. Um, 
I put this on here as the Emerald blood, blood Gas because it, I mean, it is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the options you can use, but frankly, I'm not really using it in my, uh, in my practice. I'm going for these first two. Um, abnormal vital signs, radiographic imaging at the beginning, right? Because we said if it's early normal, it doesn't really tell us anything. But if it's early bad, that's really bad. Um, and then also patient comfort. That's kind of what I'm doing to, uh, uh, to help me figure out what I'm gonna do with, with some of these patients in this position. So uh, again, drowning is a process. Drowning is not an outcome, right? Uh, it is a brain problem with lung issues. It is an issue with hypoxia. You need to give these patients oxygen, oxygen, maybe oxygen, and then you should probably give them oxygen too. Um, know your resources for your rescue and know what you have around you to help. And then your golden four to six knowing what kind of things you're looking for when you do have this patient in the ED and how you can give them best treatment. So again, I am, uh, uh, thank you again so much. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the APs at, at, uh, uh, at the Creighton Center, uh, but we used to always be called COPA or Maricopa. So if you guys hear that, that's sort of like what our, what our nickname is from our previous name. Um, and this is my contact. Uh, please feel free to let me know uh, how I can help, if I can give any other questions. Again, uh, this is a really incredible motivated group uh, and uh, I would be happy to help you guys out with your journey. So what other questions do you guys have? I will stop sharing and I will, um, and I'll just hang out for a little bit. So um, real quick, Dr. Cobb, I have a question. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm in the car, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm cool. Cool. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So frequently, at least, like, this is perhaps anecdotal based on my experience, but, like, especially in Phoenix, we see, you know, a lot of younger, you know, infant pediatric drownings. Um, and typically, like, I, maybe this is just a confirmation bias, but I've seen a lot of bad outcomes with those. Yes. So what's the difference between your infant pediatric patient versus your adult, and why do they seem to have worse outcomes? Um, because they don't have as much of a, of a hypoxic uh, reserve, right? Because these, these guys are, they don't have the same, uh, the same protective systems. Uh, and also, unfortunately, because when drowning happens with, uh, with peds, it's, uh, it's usually a, a much longer submersion incident. Uh, how do I say this correctly? A much longer relative submersion incident. I mean, we think about the people that um, are kind of held underwater for multiple minutes um, as an adult, um, but the kids are unfortunately the ones that are, um, that because they don't have the same, uh, the same tidal volumes, because they don't have the same protective features with brain hypoxia, they have a much lower time requirement to have some of these disastrous outcomes. The other really sad thing is that um, sometimes Sometimes it's not recognized early enough. I mean, we unfortunately think about the kids that are, I, I feel really badly if, if anyone's had any experience, but the kids that are kind of found at the bottom of a pool or found at the bottom of the, of the bathtub or something, um, there's really not a lot of actual time that's known for the, the, the amount of submersion. It's a really great, but really sad question. And that's why in, in Arizona here, we have so many different, uh, different societies and ways to, uh, to actually get involved in, um, uh, in drowning prevention, drowning treatment. There's always a big push every summer uh, to watch kids around water, um, both through the fire department, but also a lot of nonprofits that are here in, in the Valley too. Um, a lot of what you talked about really emphasized kind of what the pre-hospital actions are for these drowning incidents. So do you have any insight on maybe more or less helpful EMS protocols to help with that? Um, the, the most helpful EMS protocol is to stop the, is to stop the initial insult, is to, uh, is to ventilate aggressively early on um, and oxygenate aggressively early on, right? So if that means... Um, if you have someone that can tolerate a uh, nasal cannula or face mask, or if you're doing something like a nasal trumpet or an oropharyngeal airway and you're providing additional bagging or you're uh, um, pre-oxygenating before you attempt to intubate, all of those things um, are the most important thing. But the, the, the best pre-hospital intervention is to stop the drowning process and to start oxygenating as fast as possible. 
Um, Michael says, is there a strong correlation with initial EKG, PEA, VFIP, asystole, and neurologic outcomes? Not really, because there's not a really good, there's not a good predictable EKG finding in drowning. So we don't really have, um, we don't have anything specifically for drowning. So the best way to answer that question is to sort of say all comers with cardiac arrest, uh, PEA or any kind of other non-shockable rhythm like asystole uh, is gonna have the worst outcomes. Um, but unfortunately, like we talked about, you really don't get a lot of primary uh, VFib or VTAC, which are two shockable rhythms in drowning particularly, unless it was you know some big old dude that just eats cheeseburgers every day and had, a, had, a, had an MI and then fell into the water or something like that. Cool. Well guys, um, I am happy Luke. I know that Luke, I know a couple of you guys actually, I know Luke and Chris specifically, you guys have my email. So you guys, I mean, everyone's welcome to, to reach out um, uh, for my email, reach out on Twitter. Uh, let me know how I can help you again. Um, I, uh, I think this is really incredible what you guys are doing, um, and I'd love to help in any way that I can. Thanks very much. You're welcome, guys. Luke, if there is if there is anything else, uh, if there's anything else, I will take off, and I will let you guys get to your own business. Sounds good. We'll get into a little bit of business, and thank okay. you again. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Um, I always love talking with med students. So please, 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 you have my email, use it. Um, that is like just far and away. There were people that, that helped me in my journey and part of my, my mission in life is to help other people in their own. So please, please, please talk to me. Um, I, I'd love to help. Thank you guys, have a great meeting. We'll hopefully talk with you guys soon. All right. So we won't be too much more time here. I'll just share my screen really quick to the meeting notes that I shared with everyone in an email right before this. Um, so just some updates from my end. Uh, just the short term plan with this group is I really want to have each school's listservs have, that, have them all sent out an announcement and just letting them know what our group is and soliciting signups for our mailing list so that we can keep letting everyone who's interested in EM know, uh, keep them in the know about the events that we're doing and the events that we're sharing, just to get as many people involved as possible. And then in the same vein, uh, towards the beginning of September, I want to send out applications for next year's leadership. Uh, so it's been almost a year uh, that I've been the chair and it's been almost a year with everyone in their current positions. Uh, so we'll, uh, after we get uh, the new signups for the email list, then we'll send the application out and then we'll transition and just keep moving and growing. Uh, it's, a, it's a new group since this is only our second year and there's still a lot more we could do. There's certainly a lot of potential for adding things and I'm always open to ideas as I, as I hopefully make it clear every meeting. Um, just announcements for uh, events coming up and things coming up. Uh, Stephanie Butler, the executive director of AZSEP, really wants us to know about the research seed grant. Uh, so a couple of my classmates, along with a current fellow at COPA, they got uh, awarded this research grant last year. So it's certainly uh, friendly to medical students. So if you guys have a uh, resident you have a good relationship with, or you just have a project that you're passionate about, this research money through AZSEP specifically is open to us and you have uh, over two months to work on this too. Uh, so I shared the power, or I shared the Word document with that information in the email last night and I'll likely send it out again soon. Um, always good to talk about EMRA events that are coming up. So there was the Medical Student Forum and the recordings for that either are posted or will be posted soon. Uh, but the big event coming up is at the end of September, early October, where it's the residency fair, which is completely online this year, where um, all the residency programs are signing up for their uh, virtual booths right now. Uh, and then we will be able to sign up for, uh, I think, five to 10 minute slots just to talk with the program directors and learn more about the programs. Obviously, they're prioritizing MS4s, but I believe this opportunity will be open up to everybody. Uh, I'll leave this link in here for virtual interviews, especially for the people who 
are kind of staring down the barrel of those right now. And then we were asked to promote the Arizona, the University of Arizona South Campus uh, residency panel at the end of this month. Uh, that will be, the registration link is here. I mistakenly put October in the email I sent out, so I'll send out a correction with that soon. Um, and then the Texas uh, Medical Student Council wanted to share their big event with us. Uh, they are holding an event similar to the EMRA Medical Student Forum where uh, they'll have a couple of informational events, but then they'll have a kind of meet the residency event at, on Saturday, the 29th. And they're, uh, you don't have to sign up before, but they prefer that they get an idea of who will be signing up. And then moving on to school specific stuff, uh, AT still, the representative Clara let me know that she wouldn't be able to attend today. So she added uh, that they just changed over to a new uh, EMIG eboard for their group um, and they'll be transitioning by next month and they're also going to make a toy drive for pedi pediatric patients in the ER with psychiatric chief complaints and that sounds awesome. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, Jen is on if she has any updates for AZCOM. No, I don't have anything right now. No worries. Um, well, we're trying to make some contacts in Creighton. Uh, I'm reaching out right now to see if we can find anybody. I don't believe I have, I don't have Cody from Mayo on. Uh, and Chris, if you got any announcements for your EMIG. Not anything big. We just had a cool event today with some uh, EM entrepreneurs, uh, Dr. Mihail and Dr. Linder. Um, otherwise, we'll probably be transitioning or doing applications for the new leadership in a couple of months, but we've not we got nothing. Cool. Will that be recorded? I was bummed I missed that. And if so, we could promote it to everybody. Um, yeah, I think John Michael did record it. I can get the recording and definitely uh, distribute that out. It's a good idea. Cool. And I didn't see Kayla from Tucson on, uh, and she mentioned that they're working on Zoom panels. Uh, but of course, Zoom fatigue is real. <laughs> so hopefully uh, the Tucson campus can come up with a residency panel. And if I find out that they are doing that, I'll let everyone know. And then if everyone wouldn't mind, I believe I shared this with everyone for editing access. But if you're willing to send out an email on behalf of this group to your school and your listserv, uh, I'd love to have you sign up or just email me separately and let me know. And I'll get a draft out by the end of this week so we can start drumming up uh, new people getting involved in the, in the listserv so that we can keep uh, increasing our membership and really what we can do in Arizona. Uh, so if you can do that, just let me know. And that was all I had. Um, does anybody have anything else to add? Any questions? There is one question in the chat. Oh, OK. Um, are fourth years able to run for positions? Uh, current four, fourth years, like matching in March? Okay. Um, I don't think so because we do have year long appointments that would be until September of yet next year. But if um, I think if there are extenuating circumstances or we really need that representative from the school. Uh, and um, we'd be happy to have all the help we can get, honestly. And there's always gonna be projects that we could work on. Um, like I have a idea for a legislative guide that I'm hoping to write soon and we're always uh, willing to take help on that. So there should be opportunities too. And we'll keep letting everyone know as soon as we know what we are able to do in the uh, announcements. Right. And then if I don't have, if no one else has any questions or complaints or comments, then uh, I'll let you all go early. And thank you so much for helping make these monthly meetings a success. And we'll keep doing them and see what other useful lectures there'll be. And of course, let me know if you have any ideas for lectures or uh, anything you want to see and we can work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. No problem. Have a good night, everyone. You too. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Luke.